So um, I just want to welcome our guest, Dr. Lance Price, who is a professor in our department. Um, he does really great work on um, antibiotic resistance and foodborne illnesses, but he also does a lot of great work on effective communication and how to translate science um, into decision making um, and really um, around kind of how to um, the communication around that. So we brought him here today so that he can engage you in a con conversation about powerful PowerPoints and um, hopefully this will be helpful as you guys prepare your own oral presentations of your CDs um, in the next few months. So take it away. All right. So, um, Sarah, go ahead. Sarah, Sarah took my class last year and she was great and uh, it was really awesome to see like the transition. I didn't. Don't you think all your all the your co students or whatever you call them, other Class students, <laughs> classmates, <laughs> everybody just got so good by the end of the semester. I think we did that better. We did it so much. Yeah. Um, so instead of doing a whole semester, we're just gonna have you know 45 minutes or something like that. But uh, I just want to say that you know everything that I say, you have to realize. While I'll try to make it as broad as possible, everybody has to come to this with their own style, their own comfort level, and um, and you know you want your personality to come through in your talks. So you know some of these tips, these aren't hard fast rules. Anything that I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to talk first sort of generally about giving talks, mm -hmm. and and then I'll move into specifically on on powerpoints and just what I think are important about PowerPoints. Again, no hard, fast rules. But the first thing you should do is, is be speaking to your audience, right? And, and, and so what does that require? That requires knowing who your audience is. So the first thing, when, when Dr. Zoda asked me to come to this class, I was like, well, who is it? You know, who, who am I speaking to? She's like, oh, you know them all. OK. But, um, <laughs> But you know, so what? What do you want me to convey? What do you want me to get across? And you know, and I already know your education level roughly, but you should be. These are questions you should be asking when you're thinking about your CE. It's not a lot of thought, right? But what we want you to do is be ambassadors for the school, as we sort of, you know, take our new trajectory yeah. into the atmosphere, stratosphere, whatever. Um, and we want you to be great communicators of the science. Um, so. You know, think about level of education, think about subject knowledge. Are the are you speaking to your peers about stuff that they already know about? Is it a specific conference on this subject? Then if, if it is, you don't need to do any build up, you know, if it's about you know, if it's a vaginal health conference, you're not gonna, you know, you know, open your open your talk with ten minutes on, you know, the vagina, right? Sorry, I'm talking about Ami about this one. Okay, I don't usually use that as an example. <laughs> <laughs> kind of came to mind. Um, you know, are there specific interests of the of the group? Age level that really comes into what jokes you use. Um, it does matter. Geography actually. Think about if you're, you know, it's it's nice to pull in some examples to root the information that you're conveying uh, using specific examples from from the region. And then cultural quirks are fun as well. I have a question for you, Dr. Right. All right? Yeah. Talking about examples, so can you give us like an example of one time where you assess some of this inaccurately in the talk? <laughs> like right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I think um, cultural references. I'm, I'm starting to feel my age, and that sometimes in the classroom settings with with people you all age, you're all ages. Uh, Younger people sometimes, you know, I'll make references that I that I realize now, you know, they didn't see this as Spinal Tap or something, you know, and so, and 15 years ago you make that, 20 years ago you make that reference, and everybody's like, oh yeah, our amplifiers go to 11. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I think I'm learning that I'm not as young as I think I am. Um, what else? Oh, uh, sometimes. I think I made. I'm trying to think. I I, I thought wow. something would go over well with a particular group, and it didn't. 
Anyway, I can't think of any others. Um, this is a farmer's market in Des Moines, Iowa. And um, I was giving a talk on uh, E. coli infections in Des Moines. And uh, it turns out E. coli kills uh, about 36,000 to 40,000 people each year. So I, I did some research on Des Moines, you know, and I found out that 40,000 people go to the farmer's market each week. I, I, I remember this as being the association here. Anyway, <laughs> and so I pulled that into my talk and I said, you know, 36,000, 40,000 people die of E. coli infections. And then I popped this up to give people sort of a, a tangible, you know, feeling for what that, you know, 40,000 people, you know, that's not something that we can relate to all that easily, right? But if you, if you pull in a cultural reference, that helps. I was presenting before the Maryland State Assembly and I was talking about poultry production. And I found out what the, what the number was for Maryland, you know? Just glue it to their brains, help them understand. Uh, I was giving a lecture in Denmark on circumcision and I missed an opportunity, a really good opportunity. So it turns out uh, you'll see signs around the uh, around Denmark that says foreskinning. I was giving a talk about circumcision, right? It turns out this is uh, the the word for research, and I just <laughs> what an opportunity missed, right? And um, and so if I ever get invited back to talk about circumcision and the penis microbiome in Denmark, I will be pulling in. Or skinning. Okay, so know your assignment. Uh, you know that's how I opened, right? So I, you know, I found out who you guys were and what I was supposed to talk about. As you get invited to give more and more talks, this really becomes important because it's not just I'm going to a conference anymore. There's something that you're supposed to convey, so you should, you know, do a little bit of homework. It doesn't take very long. You know, who am I talking to? And what do you want me? Bullets, you know, uh, when we get to actual uh, PowerPoints. I, I don't use a lot of bullets in my talks. Uh, there's this, I, I, I saw this uh, one person presenting on PowerPoints once, and they said, bullets kill. <laughs> they, uh, talk, right? But you can pull them in every now and then, so I, you'll see I don't use them very often. Um, so who invited you, what's the subject, and what's the standard dress? This is something that really is important. Um, if you, if you don't know, tend towards the overdressed. It feels a lot better than being underdressed at a place. And everybody will think you're just um, snazzy. Um, introduce yourself. So, um, you know, you're almost always going to be introduced by, you know, somebody. Um, that was a very gracious introduction, <laughs> thank you. Um, but you want to kind of connect to your audience as well. You know, this doesn't work if you have five minutes, you know, but if you have a if you have a forty five minute talk, you wanna you wanna connect with people and it's good to get that out there right at the beginning, make a personal connection and um, and so you know the my issue is one of my one of my subjects is uh, antibiotic use of food and animal production. So sometimes if I'm presenting before a mixed audience, I want them to know that I'm not just an Ivy Ivory Tower, you know, academic. And so I'll often tell them, you know, hey, I was born in Arizona, but, you know, I grew up spending most summers on a ranch in Texas. And then I'll usually show them a cute picture of me with my dad and our cattle, right? And, and that humanizes me almost immediately with the audience, but also shows them that, you know, when I'm talking about antibiotic use and food animal production, I'm not just this guy standing in a tower. I mean, I watched my father injecting animals with antibiotics. I mean, so I kind of come from that. Um, sometimes you also want to subtly, not in a bragging way, but subtly establish yourself too, you know, if you're there to be the expert. And this is a, this is a there's a balance here, right? Because you want to endear yourself to the audience, but you also want them to understand you know what you're talking about. So sometimes I'll refer to where I studied um, or where I first became interested in a subject, which kind of throws in, yeah, I went to one of the, you know, one of the best schools of public health in the country, right? Um, and that's where I first became interested in this subject. 
I don't say I went to one of the best schools. <laughs> you know, I say, you know, this is, so I went to, I, I, was, perf I was actually um, giving a, a talk before the Maryland State Assembly again. It's always good to say that you're, uh, you know, a constituent. And so, you know, this is where I first became interested in antibiotic use and food animal production. Sometimes, sometimes I'll transition right from the, hey, you know, I spent summers in Texas, and then this is where, but this is where I really learned about it. Um, I also was on the faculty of the Translational Genomics Research Institute. So, you know, hey, I, was, I can do hardcore molecular <laughs> microbiology, you know. Um, and now I'm here, you know, now this is no longer just a fantasy, we're actually in here. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I think we, we I gotta change the name, yeah. right? Um, it shows that you're coming from a, a, a place with some reputation, right? Um, know your message. So you guys are doing research, right? Um, and there may be, you may have this, a lot of people who are doing research have a tendency to just sort of say, oh, I want to go and tell about my research. But I don't think that's the way you should approach these talks. You should, you should say, I want to go tell people about all this new, exciting stuff that I found during my research. And maybe that's an actual finding. Maybe you, but maybe you have non-conclusive research, but it's still, the process was exciting. You, know, you revealed some, some, maybe, you know, some some indication that there's a problem or a solution or something else. And so get yourself excited about what you've done and uh, try to convey what you found um, and convey the, the newness of it, the excitement of it, convey your own excitement. Um, but remember that you have a message to give, that you're not just gonna get up there and talk about my research. I hope that, that distinction comes through. Um, we're all doing public health. I think, I hope we're all drawn to public health um, because we want to make a difference, right? So we want to improve the health of others. And, um, and so while some of the work that we do may seem um, too, you know, hard to connect with, you have to make that connection for your audience. So, you know, I'm doing genomic epidemiology for the general public, you know, what is, you know, what is that? So I have to connect that to them. Or I have to help them understand when I show them a big number of people, you know, of the number of people that die of, of antibiotic resistant infections, I need to humanize that, right? We're public health and we think about things on a population basis. That's how we, that's how we come to realize that something is truly important, right? That's how we evaluate good data is on a population level using statistics and, and good good sized samples. But you still have to humanize those studies to the to your audience, right? And so it never hurts to have a little anecdote in your pocket or a story, you know, a story about a, a, a you know somebody who's been affected by whatever thing you're studying. A photo tells us a thousand words too, as they say, right? So, you know, I can put this up there and I often do. You know, C D C says that at least, you know, very conservatively, 23,000 Americans die per year of drug-resistant infections, of superbug infections, right? But it really brings it home when I say, here are just two of those 23,000 people that have died of, of drug-resistant infections. This is Carlos Don and little Simon. Both of these kids died of a MRSA infection, you know, and their parents were just two, you know, two sets of parents who paced in hospital room, hospital rooms while the doctor struggled and failed to find an antibiotic to treat their kids. Right, so you humanize, connect, connect your science to people whenever you can. Um, and, and again, remembering that, that the, way we, we, the way we decide that something is important is not based on anecdote, but anecdotes can be powerful connectors for people. Does, does that help? And it doesn't always happen, so don't, I guess the, the, the other thing to remember is that um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't overreach to get an anecdote, right? I mean, you shouldn't overreach to get a photo. If it works, it works. It's worth doing a little research to find one. And I can tell you, when you're talking to reporters, and I talk to reporters all the time, when you talk to reporters, they're like, do you have, do you know anybody who's been affected by this? 
is there anybody we can talk to who's been affected by this? So if you're working on fracking or, or you know, I don't, you know, whatever you guys are working on, I wish I had more examples. I but why don't people? Yeah. Why don't people tell you know throw out some like Mark? What do you tell tell Dr. Price what you're working on? Where is he? Um, I'm working on analyzing stakeholder interviews pertaining to climate change adaptation and applying it to health. So going through the different um, interviews and amongst various stakeholders, academics, government, um, nonprofit, and only the health goal and subject matter to kind of really this idea of what different sectors are doing in terms of reducing risk to climate change in terms of health. Great, right. So so lots of lots of good examples, right, to, to draw on. Right. If you're if you're talking about the increased uh, Increased uh, scale or or frequency of weird weather right. events, right? I mean, then you have Sandy right there, yeah. right? Um, so those are those are good. There are plenty of good images out there too. I have another good example. Yeah. So I was recently, you know, I worked a lot on flame retardants, and my research was very involved in changing legislation in California. And so I get interviewed a lot, and I was recently interviewed by the Huffington Post about kind of the implications of this policy change on low-income communities, and you know, I, I talked about my research, and then I, you know, I was talking more about the policy change and kind of how it's affected me and how I basically literally didn't have furniture for the first six months because I was waiting to buy furniture until after the policy change, January 1st. And, you know, they talked about that in the Huffington Post as well. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, you know, because it's just that, you know, because it also shows how like you as a researcher is, you know, individually connected to the things that you're studying, right? And so it also humanizes you and it gives that human angle, right? That, that, I mean, that that reporter was just like, oh my God, thank you. So <laughs> you, know, yeah. I mean, you know, that is just beautiful. Right. You know, just so um, so palpable. You know, just like your your experience there for the for the average reader. That's great. Right. Yeah. Um, so do we have other examples that people want to throw out about um, your CEs to give Dr. Price an idea? Karen, why don't you tell them what you started um, working on? I'm looking at the relationship between the antibiotic use in the outpatient setting and what has been measured in by the EPA in treated sewage sludge. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, um, I got that twenty-three thousand. <laughs> right, right. right. And, you know, resist, I, you know, there are yeah. lots of great examples on this. Yeah. So I'm just looking at concentrations of specific antibiotics that have been used quite a bit in the last, say, ten years or so, like a Z pack or clithromycin, erythromycin. Um, what else am I looking at? Tetracycline, and doxy. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. I'm looking at a uh, frequency of sperm sex chromosome disomy and dietary exposures to mercury in men from the Faroe Islands, which is a Danish colony or territory north of Scotland, and they eat a diet high in whale. Right, so, so I mean, immediately if you're talking, so you would follow disomy with, you would describe what that is immediately, right, when if you're talking to a reporter. So what's disomy? Dice me. Is that two tails on a sperm? <laughs> like, no, not two tails. <laughs> no, it's uh, uh, the, essentially the wrong number of chromosomes uh, in the in the sperm. So chromosome lock on Cool. Okay. I'm looking at the use of health-related strategies among lead certified buildings in the United States. Um, so a lot of them are have to deal with indoor air quality or access to daylight or location next to you know an alternative source of transportation to increase physical activity things like that so to build the story i could talk about schools because there's a lot of youth certified schools um talking about kids health is always yeah. good yeah so good practical examples and attaching it to obesity yeah yeah awesome um, i'm looking at coronary heart disease risk among sheet metal workers and comparing them to men same age and race in the general population of the United States. And, and so why sheet metal workers? Um, that was the data set that I came across. But, so with, you've got a, like, 
point. There wasn't something about, you just found a data set with sheet metal workers, but is there anything that they might be differentially exposed to that you Physical labor and stress, pretty much like, similar to a construction occupation. Yeah. I'm looking at occupational injuries at Department of Energy facilities. I'm largely looking at um, slips, trips, and falls. And they have a reporting system that they use internally um, that actually nobody has really analyzed. They kind of put all this information to a database and it just kind of sits there for the rest of the life. Um, so I'm actually analyzing a couple years there and trying to see if there are any trends in um, reporting. And the ones I'm actually focusing on are near misses. Mm -hmm. So things that didn't actually happen but could have ended up being a serious injury or a serious um, structural issue. Yeah, yeah. I think that those are immediately those kinds of things because we've all tripped and slipped <laughs> and fell a mm -hmm. lot. Well, not you, but not everybody else. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's an easily relatable thing. And so um, you can just you can actually pull people from how many people have slipped. Right? You know, I mean, but sometimes when you slip, this is what happens. Yeah. And so, I'm still working on it. Oh yeah. You need to work this out before the end of the class. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just tell you a couple of uh, ways that I use images. And, and um, I have used images in my talk. Some I don't use anymore because numbers have changed. But So scale I, I use uh, a lot. So um, turns out 410,000 Americans get drug resistant <coughs> salmonella and campylobacter infections each year. And so I'll show that number, and then I'll pop this up there, um, just to kind of help people. Wow, that's a that's a big number. That's the entire city of Miami, basically. Um, does that work? Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes I talk about the number of people who die of salmonella, or sorry, of E. coli and Staph aureus infections, the two biggest bacterial killers in the United States. And the number, at least three years ago, was about 58,000 a year, 58, 59,000 a year, which is almost exactly the same number as is on the Vietnam Memorial Wall. And so this was a sort of, a, I think, a powerful image to bring that number home. That's, that's the number of people that die every year in the United States from these two bacterial infections. And this was the total number of people died who died during the entire Vietnam War. And the Americans. So can you talk a little bit about how you, like how did you come upon thinking about this image? You know what, I... You're just that good. Yeah, I'm just like, I know all these facts. I mean, I have a photographic memory. Um, what's your memory again? <laughs> no, I, I just kind of search around, you know? I mean, I think... You, these things, preparing these things is, have, has got to be fun for you, you know, and, and if you find a good image, if you find a good connector, and, and, and it's your subject, and as you guys become subject experts and go on to work on these things, it's, it's worth investing the time to find these little images or tools, and, and sometimes I feel like I'm just being a total idiot, and I'm wasting so much time drawing little figurines or little figures or, or uh, finding images like this. But then I, I, I go back to them a lot. Um, and so it's, it's really, you know, find your key numbers, find key pieces in your talk that you think are important to convey, and then think about different ways of conveying them. Is it an image? Is it a figure? Is it a, it could be a graph. It could just be a number on a slide, just like boom. Um, you know, there are diff different ways to do this. You know, sometimes I get lucky and there's something like this. And then they change, they revise the numbers and then I can't use it anymore. I'm, just, I'm waiting, I need that number to you to go up or down again. Um, sometimes, so here's another thing that I do. I talk about antibiotic use in human medicine versus antibiotic use in food animal production. So here's a little scaling thing, right? So we use, you know, 7.7 .7 million pounds of antibiotics in human medicine and we use 30 million pounds in animal production. A bigger pill, obviously, about four times the size as this. I need to double check whether I scaled that properly. <laughs> I was it's probably that. not quite big enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to rescale it. Um, yeah, and so this, this could be even more effective if I would scale it properly. And you know what, I'm pr usually pretty detail-oriented when it comes to that. If I'm drawing you know, different size circles, I'll <coughs> calculate the area of the circle, but I obviously didn't do that. Um, 
that's probably only about three times the size. Um, CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, and a lot of you have seen these images. You know, but for the general public, when I'm talking about how animals are raised, I want to talk about how quickly diseases spread among the animals and how introducing antibiotics to this environment is a bad idea. You know, these images speak for me, right? I don't, I don't have to say a whole lot. You know, I just point out that that's feces, that not dirt, and um, and then sometimes I'll show this image in this series, and I'll say. Hey, we learned a long time ago if they cram people together too closely together, uh, military recruits, that they would get sick and die before they ever hit the battlefield because they were sharing microbes. And the military's response was not to give everybody antibiotics, but to uh, institute mandatory bunk distances, both horizontal and vertical. Uh, and that decreased infection rates. Uh, but somehow, we've lost this lesson in the way that we raise our animals. Um, I've had mixed, I've had mixed feedback on that. Some people think that breaks up the flow with the with the capo images, and some people really like it because it brings it home. What do you guys think? I like it. I, like it. I do too. Those people are. <laughs> I feel like it connects it back to humans. Though. Right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And it, and it brings home this this how ridiculous it would be to cram you know, 75,000 people into a little building with no clothes on and throwing their their food onto their feces, <laughs> you know? I mean, that would be a bad idea, right? Because why? Because you immediately know we'd get sick. So why wouldn't the animals? And then when I talk, I, sometimes I'll use the term antibiotic use, abuse to describe how antibiotics are used in food animal production. And I'll just show this machine. This machine injects eggs with antibiotics. It's injecting eggs, literally billions of eggs every year with antibiotics in the United States. There's one of the companies that does it, Pfizer. Uh, and then they come out the other side and they go into the hatcheries and they become chickens. And, and there, there was this beautiful study from Canada that showed that when they stopped doing this, antibiotic resistance plummeted in Canada. Specific mm -hmm. kinds of antibiotic resistance. Anyway, I think that those images are really powerful because sometimes you say, if I say, oh, we inject billions of eggs in the United States with, with antibiotics, people go, who's going to do that? You know, come on, and how do you inject an egg? But when you show them a machine that somebody invented to do this, um, it's, it's a lot more, uh, you know, believable, I guess. I think it's important to diffuse the science. And I'm going to show you some images that I use, and a lot of you have already seen my characters for doing this. I just want to say this with the caveat that I'm, you know, I'm obviously in a much more senior place than you guys. And so you have to strike the balance of, of being taken seriously and diffusing, but still diffusing the science. Because if you come out the gate talking about uh, diploidy angio thingy, what is it called? Dicey. Dicey, yeah. Sorry, yeah, it's not that hard, right? <laughs> I'm a microbiologist, we don't deal with these guys. Um, if you, if you use too big of words right off the bat, they'll, people will turn off their brains. They'll say, oh, I can't understand this. And that'll even happen among our peers, where they will, if you come out the gate with terms that they don't know, they'll just turn off. And so um, I think that we, we have to soften the science sometimes. And you know, and my thing is with the Fisher-Price characters, right? So people and bacteria and lightning bolts and all that. And that works for me, and I feel like, and I get, lots and lots of good response from audiences that range from um, from very general audiences to to super molecular biologists and so that's worked for me um, but again I think it's a balance and there's ways of softening it without using cartoon characters but you can I think making people smile always helps them. and then you know I use some simple statements Okay. Animations are cool. And you guys hopefully have seen this where I try to explain how resistance, how bacteria become resistant through natural selection. And um, and you can actually teach people evolution right there, you know, killing off the susceptible bacteria. And I'll just say that, you know, doing these animations 
took me a little bit of time. So I'm there I'm trying to explain uh, binary fission, how fast bacteria can grow. Uh, you can go from a single cell to a billion, or a trillion actually, in 24 hours. 